Hey, welcome back to Volumes. If you've never been here before, this is a weekly podcast where guests come on and teach me about something I don't really know much about. This week, my friend Alex came on and taught me a lot about mental health. We kind of just covered the main sort of topics, but we never really got super deep into the subject. We both agreed it'd be brilliant if we did a second episode. So if you guys like this episode, let me know and uh, we'll get that arranged. We'll get a second episode and we'll really dive in deeper into the subject. Thanks for listening. Would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Alex, um, otherwise known as the Hippie Chickpea on Instagram and on my blog. Um, yeah, I feel like that's that's all I have to say about. <laughs> and you're here to talk about what? Um, about mental health and eating disorders in particular. Perfect. So, what is your relationship with uh, mental health and eating disorders? So, um. I think, well, mental health is something we all have and I think it's, you know, it comes in ebbs and flows and it's definitely a spectrum. Um, But I think I first started really struggling with my mental health um, probably when I was about 13 or 14 and I struggled like with anxiety and this was mostly focused around, I put a lot of pressure on myself to do well um, in like exams and in school and things like that, but it got to an extent that you know I was having like anxiety attacks and things so it was a bit more than your average um stress Mm -hmm. about exams and yeah I guess so that's kind of was my first experience and then um yeah I've since just over a year ago I've been in recovery from an an eating disorder which um kind of came into I think into the forefront um when I was at university it became sort of a serious thing it's sort of hard to pinpoint where it all began mm-hmm. um because I think yeah it is a, a spectrum these kind of things you know um between dis- disorder eating and a, like an actual diagnosable eating disorder but yeah it was sort of yeah kind of became more serious when I was at uni and then um, have been in sort of recovery and sort of seeking help right. um, since, yeah, kind of, well, actively aware of it and doing stuff about it since um, just over a year ago. So you said that you first sort of experienced anxiety when you were yeah. 14? Or was yeah, it? around that, yeah. Right. So did you seek help then? No, so I didn't realise that it was anxiety. I honestly just thought I was stressed right. and... Did you kind of think everyone was going through the same sort of thing? Yeah, or? I suppose whenever I spoke to it about, yeah, whenever I spoke about it with friends or um, with family members, I yeah, I think, yeah, people were just like, oh yeah, no, I feel the same. Like I'm really stressed out too. And I just never really thought anything of it. And right. I think my parents could see that I wasn't okay, but mm-hmm. they weren't really aware. And even I think if I had known it was an actual thing, <laughs> I don't really know what I would have done about it. I mean, I did end up speaking to some teachers. I was living abroad at the time um, and I did get a little bit of support. But I think, yeah, mental health is such a... People either aren't aware of it or if they are aware, they just don't really know what to do. And I just didn't... Yeah, of course. Yeah, it was just kind of something I kind of brushed under the rug and it kind of, yeah, came and, and went like the summer holidays came and then I was fine I wasn't stressed or anxious anymore and it just yeah it was always something I kind of buried under the rug and just kind of got on with just never really I never really looked into the root of what caused it did you find it hard to talk about or was it not I suppose I just wasn't really aware that I was experiencing it because I wasn't really aware of my own mental health I think we're taught so much about physical health yeah um, absolutely but there just isn't really yeah, I mean, didn't learn anything in school about it. Um, you so know, do you think there's not enough done in regards to our mental health? 100%. I think things are getting better now and mm-hmm. I'm really seeing a, a huge movement, especially since I've been more open in, um, like through my blog and things, mm-hmm. talking about mental health and um, trying to like raise awareness and like education around it. I think there's so many other people doing the same. There has been a big sort of movement recently, but definitely... Yeah, like, you know, even a few years ago, it was very, very different. Yeah, I, t- I totally agree with you. So when you said that 
you had a relationship with eating disorders and was that you, when was it that you realized that was something so to pay attention to? after my first year of university um sort of after yeah so after I'd finished the first year I kind of realized that I mean I'd been very stressed out and anxious and I think also quite a bit depressed at times too and um, sort of gone through <clears throat> stages of that again um it's hard because I've never been like diagnosed with depression but right. I have definitely experienced some depressive episodes I suppose mm-hmm. like times in my life and it's, it's hard because I don't I don't want to um say that I had something when I haven't been you know I because I don't know um it's it's hard it's such a can be such a sensitive Abu, subject Abu, and yeah. I don't want to offend anyone that is suffering with a clinically diagnosed thing to be like yeah. oh I you know a lot of people would say oh I've been depressed or I've been this been that um but I do you know I think I did experience a lot of really low times um but it was just sort of after that first year of university I realized that what I went through wasn't normal it wasn't just right, stress yeah. and I had been again like I did when I was 14 burning under the rug being like oh no I was just stressed I'm fine now so I had the summer holidays and I was like oh no everything's okay I'll just go back to you have a better work-life balance and everything will be fine yeah but I think at the back of my mind I knew there was more going on and I right. wasn't really aware of what it was but um yeah I realized that it wasn't maybe it wasn't completely normal but I kind of didn't want to really address it and I was like no it's fine I'll I can deal with it myself I'll go so back. how did you then address it um well I didn't you so I, I went <laughs> back to uni for the second year and just things kind of dwindled till Christmas time when I then finally realized that I wasn't okay right um so yeah so back to your question when did I finally realize um I came home for the well it was just before the Christmas holidays and I was last just, year 2018 um, or 2017 2017 right I yeah I just realized that I wasn't okay I was having breakdowns I was just really not myself I just right. didn't mm-hmm. feel myself whatsoever so I decided I was finally going to do something and I went to speak to a support person at the university and he was the first person that said to me the words eating disorder and I hadn't even sort of mentioned anything along the lines Mm -hmm. I'd sort of um I think he asked me a few questions it's all a bit hazy now and I think he was just obviously maybe what I said with the replies he kind of knew what to ask me where to kind Uh of prod and expand on things he knew knew how to ask me because I wasn't self-aware enough Uh I wasn't you I was kind of in, in denial. Yeah, yeah I was like going with like a preconceived. Exactly, I, I wasn't I ready from. to open up, um, right. and I found it very difficult to talk about those things. Um, mm. And he was the first person that said that to me. And I remember when he said it, he was like, "You know, I think you should go to your GP to, you know, seek some further help." And I remember, like, you know, there's like alarm bells going off in my mind, but deep down, I was like, "Yeah, like." I think I I need mm-hmm. to. There was something, like my intuition was sort of, yeah, tugging at me, being like, yeah, you need to, you know, trust what he's saying and sort of go along. And because I, I knew I wasn't okay, and I I didn't want to be the way I was. Like mm-hmm. there was, even, a tiny bit. There was a part of me that was wanting to like change, even yeah. if the the rest of me was like, nope, you're fine. Yeah, yeah. Just get on with things. Stop being a drama queen. You're not bad enough. You're not unwell enough. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of when I realized that I needed to do something mm-hmm. and then it all, all went from there. So then you went to your GP. Yeah. And then what was it that they said? Um, yeah, so they, well, actually, funnily enough, I came home to Glasgow and went to see my GP and she didn't really pick up on anything no. at all. And this is my like family GP. And I think part of it was because I just wasn't, ready to open up and speak about things I was able to say that I was anxious and that I was crying all the time and um couldn't stop thinking I couldn't sit down and just relax and you know all all of these kind of surface things but I couldn't talk about my relationship with food I couldn't talk about my obsessive exercising I couldn't I was sitting in there 
um, with a, a huge coat on. She couldn't see that I was physically now becoming quite unwell as well. And yeah, she just didn't really, you know, which is understandable, I think. It's it's quite hard to pick up on some people. You know, some people it's more obvious than others because it. I think what a lot of people forget that it is a mental illness. You know, it does and can manifest physically, but not always, and not until it gets to some like a certain point. And mm-hmm. some people, you know, it it really varies. <clears throat> and yeah, so nothing happened with that. And I then went back to the guy at the uni and said that you know it hadn't really. Because I, I wanted her to ask me, but I, yeah. I, at the same time, I didn't. And I couldn't mm-hmm. put myself in the position for her to. And even if she had, I think it would have taken a very strategic question to get me to open up. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, so I told the guy at the uni and he was like, right, go and see your GP in Dundee at uni and I'll write a little backstory right, okay. letter. So, yes, then I went and then they asked me the right kind of questions yeah. and then were able to yeah refer me to external services so that's how it kind of so your eating disorder what was it uh what were the actual traits of it pardon my Um, naivety oh no not at all so um i suffered from anorexia and orthorexia um orthorexia is sort of a new kind of term that's been coined and it's not officially recognized by the dsm which is the kind of psychological manual that all of these mental health kind of conditions are kind of recorded in with sort of diagnostic markers and etc right, okay um so again it really varies from person to person um so the kind of traits i had somebody else might not have at all or mm-hmm. there, there's some kind of classic traits i didn't really have so um i mean there's so many things but yeah, I was had a very unhealthy relationship with exercise. Um, right. Kind of, kind of compulsive, kind of obsessive exercising. Um, I was restrictive of my like food intake. Sort of um, very obsessed with like macronutrients and having certain percentages of things and tracking my stuff online. So you were very um, conscious of everything you were eating. Yeah, um, and was very, the orthorexia part was very, I was very into kind of clean eating and very, very healthy, right, and, okay. but to an extent that it was having a negative effect mm-hmm. on not only my physical health, but my mental health. It wasn't, it's funny because I, a lot of people say, oh, an eating disorder is a diet gone wrong. And to some extent that holds some truth, but it's it's a lot more than that the food and the exercise is the surface manifestation of it all it's the it's the psychological roots like for each person it has kind of different issues underlying it and for me it was a whole, well a whole host of things but one aspect of it was like like a coping mechanism for the fear of not being good enough fear of like right. failure um it can be um, a perfectionism thing not that you're not that you're wanting perfection or believe it's possible but just that you're not doing enough or you need to change yourself kind of wanting acceptance or right, okay. rejection like there's so many contributing external factors from childhood from different aspects of life that can go towards it but um so that's why I think the traits can be so different in lots of different people um, and there's so many, yes, yeah, so many different traits. It's it's hard to delve into every aspect of it. But I mean, those are a few like um, that were particularly prominent in mine. Do you think anything specific triggered this? Or was it something you've kind of had all your life and just never really paid attention to it and it just progressively got worse? Mm, good question. Um, I don't think it's something I've had my whole life. Definitely not. Um, I mean, looking back, there may be some small signs of like disordered eating like I remember when I was younger kind of I had quite negative body image kind of I didn't want to lose weight per se but you know we're always surrounded with with media and I kind of felt that I wanted to strive to achieve a a different kind of body type or to tone up or be healthier or be fitter Mm because I was never very sporty as a child um but there, no, I don't think there were really any signs until maybe I was about 17, 18. Um, and then it started the kind of, yeah, wanting to be healthy and fit kind of 
there was a more of a psychological aspect to it. it wasn't just that kind of surface so I, it's hard to say whether one thing triggered it but I think for me a big factor in mine was yeah just not feeling good enough literally right. just really crippling low self-esteem and for a lot of people that is uh, the same for them you know just really not feeling good enough in your own skin not feeling comfortable in your own skin and needing that control to of your diet or of your exercise not only to do with body image because mine wasn't like that was one factor but definitely just that kind of achievement you know false sense of improving yourself improving your diet being healthier being stricter on yourself be more mm-hmm. disciplined um you know it's very all or nothing kind of mindset for me that I yeah wanted to strive in this area and I think it was also fear of failure when I you know I put a lot of my identity onto my grades and onto academia and it was just kind of another facet of that I ended up putting a lot of my identity onto my diet and onto fitness and having this part of me um you know it almost yeah it becomes part of your identity and who you are and how you are able to function in life um yeah it kind of becomes yeah coping mechanism a way to distract and numb from feelings towards yourself that you don't really want to deal with yeah so what was uh or what is rather the road to recovery like what does that look like and where does that start and and what, what how do you fix it basically that's what i'm asking how do you go towards trying to make it better so yeah recovery <laughs> it's again different for every person because i think mental health is so personalized towards that person because it is yeah has so many different causative factors and external influences but recovery it has to begin in yourself you can't right. force someone to to do it whether it's an eating disorder whether it's alcohol addiction whether it's yeah depression or um ocd or trauma like this you have to really really want it in yourself mm-hmm. and yeah unfortunately for some people it does get to the point that they are forced into treatment whether that's because it compromises their physical health so much or whether you know their section because it becomes a danger to other people around them um you know sometimes recovery is initiated in those kind of ways but I think the most effective and sustainable way to and the only really possible way to recover fully is to have that want within yourself and that's why I'm so grateful that I recognized what was going on with me sooner rather than later it was already at a point that it was really not great health-wise but I was so glad I was able to find that motivation and that realization that I wasn't okay and then take the take the action to do it myself rather than being forced into it because I think that would have I think the deeper you are it's the harder it is to get out so yeah I think first thing is really finding that motivation within yourself and finding that drive that you want to get better and you want to recover and then it would be reaching out reaching out to friends family Mm -hmm. healthcare professionals um that can be quite controversial thing especially you know a lot of people argue that mental health isn't as well funded or resourced and I Mm -hmm. don't think it is but the help that is available can be so helpful and so so good um I've been really lucky to have a a really great experience with the NHS but at the same time a lot of people I know haven't had a great response and yeah I, I guess I'm just one of the lucky ones but there's a lot of work still to be done in that area for sure so yeah help reaching out to people whether it's the NHS um even recovery coaches or other professionals that maybe work more independently it's so important to have some kind of men- mentor whether that's a therapist a coach just someone that you can talk to and either hold you accountable or give you strategies or mechanisms or just be someone to get all the stuff in your brain out to yeah it's definitely the next step and then it kind of goes from there I think it's a very 
it's a very rocky journey it definitely for me at least and I think most people it gets harder before it gets better but it's so so incredibly worth it once you start to get out of the other side and see how far you come but even with recovery with mental health in general I don't think the journey ever fully ends I do believe there's you get to a point where where you can say you are recovered but Mm -hmm. at the same time you know mental health is something that comes in comes in bouts it's like any kind of illness you know you you feel more sensitive and more susceptible at different points of your life you'll have different different things will happen in your life and you know you might struggle again or in in a different way and I think our mental health is something you always want to be mindful of and yeah you something you always want to be taking care of just like you take care of your your men your physical health so yeah you should you should you know it's like mental health of course you, you want to strive for physical fitness but also mental fitness mm-hmm. and part of that i think comes into yeah working on working on yourself per- personal growth um spirituality kind of self-help all those realm of things can be yeah. so so helpful um in in combination with more professional medical for lack of a better word kind of help so speaking of medical help and and institutions and stuff do you think the nhs do enough in regards to mental health i think they do as much as they can but the problem is that i don't think mental health is as well funded as it should be um a, a close friend of mine um she was trying to get help for for her sort of eating disorder um she's previously had help but is now feeling that you know she's fit her physical health is a lot better and she's not struggling as much as other people might be but she's still struggling and she still Mm. would like help but due to the funding and the resources then the nhs just does doesn't have room to support her and which is it's so hard there just isn't really any scope for preventative mental health care at the moment uh, same with physical health like lifestyle medicine there just isn't enough pre- preventative stuff that's the only only gripe <laughs> i have with our healthcare system i think it's incredible and it's so we're so privileged to have that free support in healthcare mm-hmm. available but just underfunded yeah because the way it works you you can only get that help when you're sick enough yeah. and you know like in comparison to other countries that uh, work on keeping you well mm-hmm. rather than only treating you when you get unwell you know that kind of model I think would be really beneficial for us to approach slightly more just yeah just have more preventative stuff out there you know and um, why why wait until it's bad enough until you're sick enough until it's really you're really deep in that hole because then it's just harder to get out and you're the NHS ends up spending more money and more time and more resources but it's just I don't know what the answer is and it's something I've been thinking about a lot like what can I do to help and is there you know what what can we do to change this and the answer lies in prevention but how we can adopt this and change the the structure in the system I'm not sure. I suppose the irony is that if you had something physically wrong with you, they'd want to get rid of that as soon as possible, no matter what it is, no matter what disease or illness. But in regards to mental health, they wait until it becomes a necessity to work on. They don't try and get it as early. Am I right in saying this? Yeah, I think that's a particular problem with eating disorders. I think the stigma that lies around them, the stereotype that I, I believe, because it's the only one that we're kind of educated for lack of a better word on you know we we educate ourselves from what we see in the media and Mm -hmm. everything in that realm is very weight orientated and yes quite a few of the like diagnosable eating disorders have a an aspect to them that that really do affect the physical health and and your Mm -hmm. weight but it's so much more than that you know somebody could be suffering from a restrictive eating disorder such as anorexia but not be scientifically underweight right and because of that it's harder for them to get help or they might not be aware that that's what they're suffering from because they feel like they don't fit that right. diagnostic yeah. um 
marker they, they feel like they're not ill enough because their weight is okay and you know you could be mentally in such a bad place but because it hasn't affected you physically as drastically as someone else they might not either get that help or feel that they can reach out for that help they feel like they mm-hmm. might not deserve that help and I know for me for a long time I didn't either and it wasn't till my physical health took such a toll that then I was like actually you know what I think this is really affecting me more than I realize it's I can't manage it on my own right okay yeah so quite like uh someone that could be depressed might not look depressed because they smile and they laugh and yeah they look yeah it's no different you you know yeah because it is a mental illness and yeah it's hard because I feel like it's it's really difficult to raise awareness and really educate on this area because it's such a sensitive topic I think talking about people's weight in any kind of in any form is so difficult and when it's applied to that kind of illness and trying to trying to educate is so hard because uh, truthfully a lot of the severer I don't know patients I suppose suffering from eating disorders you know it becomes that point that they are very malnourished but it's hard to like can you really put a severity to it like it is a spectrum but it is it's just so difficult to put like is this extreme is this less extreme Mm -hmm. like how can you really measure it because it's mental you know it's you can't really put it into the into words to like Mm -hmm. measure it and really you know where where do you draw the line where do you say that someone is has disordered eating or has a diagnosable eating disorder or is um well enough to just have outpatient care or ill enough for inpatient care you know like how much does weight come into play how much does their how do you quantify their mental feelings and emotions it's just such a gray area and and such a a difficult a difficult realm yeah of course do you think schools do enough teaching us a uh, younger age on uh, mental health no <laughs> mm, personally I would say no but then I don't know if that's just my own experience maybe things have changed since I left school mm-hmm. but yeah I feel like my understanding around mental health and the different mental illnesses was very limited to the mm-hmm. stereotypes we hear on the media and I think that could be quite damaging because it's probably you know people younger and younger are either suffering from mental illness or becoming more aware I don't know that's a question I've been asking myself like is it is mental health becoming more prevalent or is it becoming just more spoken about and people are becoming more aware like I don't know how much media comes comes into play that's another question Mm. but yeah people younger and younger are suffering but they that because of the lack of education they're not aware so then it becomes you know just a latent thing they kind of push it aside until it gets you know to their their like late teens mm-hmm. or young young adults and then it becomes more prominent and affects them more because it's been going on for so long and I think schools would you know it, incorporating it into the education system would be such a an easy way to increase awareness and yeah, education and um, improve the mental health of our next generation I think if there was more awareness understanding education then it would then help people it, it would act as a form of preventative care really mm-hmm. um yeah, I think if people understand about mental health and they can be more aware of their own and then take care of it more, it kind of, you know, a bit of a domino effect there. So yeah, I definitely think things could be improved in schools. Going back to the point you made about how prevalent it's com- becoming, do you think that as just becoming more knowing about, known about, and that's why more people are confident to come out and say, this or that and that's why they, what, what they have wrong with them or what 
they're failing or whatnot? Or do you think it's more so uh, that people want to be considered this or that because it's becoming so common? Almost like people just want to jump on the bandwagon because it's a bit more popular now. I'm not claiming anyone has yeah as doing this. But, or do you think? Hmm. Do you think more people uh, went before it became more popular to talk about mental health still had the same issues but just didn't talk about them? Yeah, I think so. I think part of it is definitely what you're saying. I think now it's becoming more widely spoken about and accepted and mm-hmm. just less, slightly less of a taboo subject. I think people are becoming more confident and able to come out with their own struggles. I think that's definitely one aspect and a really important one that people feel they can speak about things and not have the worry that it might affect them mm-hmm. in their career or their friends or family might treat them differently, etc. I think that's definitely one aspect of it. I don't know if... I don't know. I wouldn't like to think that people are jumping to kind I of label either. themselves. No. Um, but just as you said, you're, yeah. you're, you're 100% mm. right in saying that it's more people seem to be having more um, more things to talk about in regards to their mental yeah. health. I think potentially due to the lack of like solid education that people might be misdiagnosing themselves with things um especially like the younger generation but at the same time that's not to say that they that's not that i'm trying to say that they might be um, lying about it yeah Yeah. or like not to invalidate their struggles at all but they might just be i don't know pointed in the wrong direction to what their real root their struggles which is why I say it's always really beneficial to reach out for further help and not be afraid to instead of kind of diagnosing yourself and then kind of taking the responsibility that you need to struggle with all your struggles yourself um because yes a lot of it majority of it comes from your own inner self-work even going to see a therapist like Mm -hmm. they don't really do the work they facilitate the work you know they help you see things differently or draw things together but in the end you are the person that's in control of what you take from those sessions and how you incorporate them into your life and how you change the way you think and feel and act um but yeah potentially people might be like that that is could be a worry that people um might be deterred from getting help because they think they could diagnose themselves and kind of deal with it in that way but generally I think people do have a quite a sound understanding of their own mental health and you know I you know you'd think oh you you can understand your own mind the best but I think it just really depends on the person and their level of self-awareness and yeah all that kind of thing yeah, it's interesting, interesting question. <laughs> uh, do you think that uh, the internet and social media is having a negative effect on people's mental health? 100%. Yeah. I think there's no, there's no doubt about that. I think social media can be so beneficial in uh-huh. other ways. And I'm, again, recently definitely seeing a movement towards more um, constructive, almost like communities on social media that are really working to develop a more positive message and cultivate a yeah a a better community that's not affecting mental health in a negative way and that's definitely what I've tried to do across my social media channels is really yeah go go against that kind of that grain that's almost been formed across not only like Instagram and facebook but youtube like there's so many there's a lot of negative stuff out there yeah. but it's you know it's all about kind of self-censoring yourself and becoming aware and trying not to engage in that but um yeah they're definitely there's there's no doubt in saying that there it has been affecting people of all ages negatively and it's it's so easily done it's so easy to get caught up on in comparison to other people in you know feeling like you know it can really 
add fuel to the fire of feeling that you're not good enough or that you need to improve yourself or change yourself or whatever it is there's a lot of um, ammunition on there that if you're in that kind of sensitive vulnerable mindset you know it really can hit hard and that's what kind of worries me especially for the younger generation obviously like we both grew up in a time where (laughs) yeah like social media was growing but I, I mean I don't know about you but I wasn't I think I was maybe 13 when I first got Facebook and Instagram was just kind of starting then so I was way older than that yeah I don't think I, I touched social media until I was like 17 16, oh wow 17 well that's maybe. you know even better but yeah. we both had like a chunk of time when we were growing up that we didn't have any of that yeah. um and people younger and younger are getting into that and it it is hard when you're younger and you you have a different kind of mindset I think it's a lot more common for young people to think in a more black and white kind of mindset you know um it's harder to kind of see the gray area and to also be able to make that distinction between what's online and what's real life yeah. what's realistic and what's unattainable and not set the bar too high for yourself especially people with that kind of type a perfectionistic personality it's you know can really um be difficult but going back to the idea of coping and 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 whatnot had you ever met anyone going through the same thing as you and do you think if you have does that help sort of seeing that someone else is going through the same sort of thing and that they're okay you know and learn from them or understand yeah um, from a different perspective i didn't really till kind of way after being yeah like quite far into my recovery I didn't really come across people and most people I did were over social media actually I met a few people a few friends in person that had gone through similar thing when they were younger but a big chunk I kind of I did feel quite alone Um, but that's when I did come across people online whether it was Instagram or YouTube it was it did was a real motivator it really did help to feel like you know I'm not alone I'm not the only person that this has happened to and there is a way out and you can be in such a better place and you know it is possible and I think that was really great and to also hear their like tips and things and you know I think it is having that kind of personable kind of side of things because um I mean some but not not all um therapists or health kind of professionals have that personal experience or even even if they do often they can't really disclose it because it's just not really professional in that Mm. setting in that scenario but it's really nice to have that kind of personal touch which I feel like social media that's one bonus that people by having that vulnerability and connection you can really help others and and make a difference in that way yeah I I feel yeah yeah interesting (laughs) yeah which is I guess why what kind of led me to speak about my own mental health right, and yeah, that, that's go kind into of kind of the to. the realm of things that I did with my social media because I really wanted to do the same that and and me not not exact same because it's different for everyone but uh-huh. try and help others in the way that I felt I was helped. So is that what influenced you to go out your way and create this sort of content and and create a platform and speak? Yeah, about Yeah, a hundred percent. Um. You know, I, I do believe that everything happens for a reason. And, and although I would never want to go back to the time of my life, mm-hmm. I do think it really led me into a different path. It was a real wake up call that I wasn't mm-hmm. doing the right yeah. thing with my life and um, has really taught me so much about my own health and about health and life in general and has kind of ignite, ignited that passion I already had for helping people, but in such a a different way and on a different level and yeah that's kind of what has now led me into wanting to do my own health coaching mm-hmm. and make content um not just on eating disorder recovery because I try to make my my writing as kind of <laughs> vague vague isn't the word but as kind of open to everybody so yeah. that even if you haven't suffered from a mental illness or an eating disorder or anxiety or you know we all the kind of root 
things that manifest into these mental illnesses Mm -hmm. are universal topics like low self-esteem fear of failure fear of rejection fear of judgment these universal feelings that we have you know they are the root of these mental health issues and if I can share insight onto those or help people with those I think that is the kind of key to really preventing people from try and make it getting into that place openly uh, applicable to yeah is it a- as accessible and yeah yeah as easily connectable <laughs> if that makes sense yeah, um, uh, yeah so although yeah I'm I'm definitely not a therapist or any um thing like that at the moment um you know fingers crossed maybe in the future but the kind of work I'm doing with um the people I coach and the kind of content and writing I'm doing at the moment either on my blog or on Mm -hmm. Instagram I like to focus on those issues those kind of root causes because I think that's where yeah that's where all lies yeah Yeah. (laughs) that's where the magic happens (laughs) so what's next what's the big thing coming up for you Oh, I mean... Or I've, big things coming up Yeah, for you. I've got so many ideas and so many things I want to work on. And definitely continuing all the brainstorming on how I can try and make a difference on a broader scale, whether it's trying to work with maybe different healthcare people to try and maybe change the system, maybe work on developing some different, um, like, work, kind of workshops or you know those kind of things um or I'd love to try and get into schools maybe do some work with younger people I mean these are all like big ideas I'd love to delve into in the future but next next up um I'm just continuing to develop my own coaching which I just launched recently recently (laughs) recently um uncover coaching and working on writing a book um, to do with kind of Mm self-help um recovery mental health but in a more general sense but i'd love to also do some more um specified kind of eating disorder recovery material out there because i think it would be helpful for it to come from a more holistic point of view yeah uh, for sure less textbook more yeah uh, real and more genuine more yeah so those are yeah some of the things and then yeah just getting back into all the different social media things just kind of growing right. a sense of community and connection with people yeah. and hopefully help some help some people out there speaking of social media is there anything you want to plug oh um well i suppose if anyone wants to check out my instagram and whatnot it's at the hippie chickpea all the um, links will be in the description same with my blog is the same the hippie chickpea.com uncoveredcoaching.com but yeah that's everything really um any closing words Oh, I don't know, just to anybody listening, just to take care of themselves and to really not be afraid to reach out. You know, I think something that really stopped me and stops a lot of people is not believing that mm-hmm. things are bad enough. Yeah. Um, but I think if anything to you feels like you aren't living your best life, then that's worth addressing, you know, and it can be on any scale, whether that's the job you're in you're maybe not doing the kind of hobbies or you're not doing things that you used to love doing you've kind of abandoned stuff or whether that's to do with your mental health whether you're really struggling to you feel more withdrawn from life or you just don't have that same lust for life or spark Mm -hmm. that you used to you know it can be in all different scales I think anything that isn't you living as your happiest healthiest self is worth and deserving of attention and you are the only person that can give yourself that attention and that care and it's about you know it's self-care give, giving yourself that time to really address those things to improve your life because life's too short not to be living it as your <laughs> you know as your best self those are um, the best and most heartwarming closing words ever <laughs> oh it's thanks <laughs> uh thank you for coming oh no thank you for this. having me honestly um yeah i feel like i could ramble on for ages but hopefully i've maybe it would have part two. Oh, maybe people enjoy maybe, this yeah, one yeah um, and people will enjoy this one this is brilliant thank you very much thank you so much
Thanks for watching episode three of Volumes. If you have any suggestions on who should be on next week's episode, let me know. Uh, all my social medias are linked below in the description. Message me on any social media if you think you know someone to be really good for the show. Or if you want to suggest yourself and come on and talk about whatever subject you're really passionate about or know a lot about. If you enjoyed this episode, please let me know by hitting like. If you're watching on YouTube, please remember to hit subscribe. And if you're listening on SoundCloud, uh, please follow. Also, the podcast will be coming to iTunes very soon, so you get it straight from the podcast app on your phone. Lastly, thanks for listening. All of Alex's social medias will be linked below. And yeah, thank you.